Ready? Good afternoon, and thanks for the introduction. Um, when I meet people for the first time, just like these last few days, and I tell them about what I'm doing for work, the responses tend to show a certain degree of surprise. I'm from Austria, and this fact does not sit naturally with my specialization in Arabic type design and typography. In these conversations, after some initial probing in which my interlocutor verifies that his hearing did not fail him, there is a more or less veiled stare of disbelief. Really? Then, with relief on the face, comes the follow-up statement, Oh, wow, you speak Arabic. To which I answer, I know some Arabic, I've studied it on and off, but it's very basic. Throwing my counterpart back to his startled state. But how can you design Arabic type? If you're not fluent in Arabic, is the inevitable next question. And I'm sure some of you had the same thought. A few months ago, I had the same conversation with a colleague of mine. He's a type designer, but has no expertise in non-Latin scripts. Our exchange went along similar line as I described. And then he mentioned something that I found helpful for the point that I'm trying to make here today. He told me of an, of an encounter he had had with an Arab calligrapher trained in a Quranic school. My colleague told me that according to this calligrapher, a script is part of a cultural whole which cannot be understood without being familiar and knowing in depth the literature, the poetry, and other expressions of that culture, even cuisine. To me, this anecdote was a gift of God, and the pun is intended. I can understand and relate to the emotional appeal of this view. It is suggestive, and it conjures up images of a culture that are easy to grasp. But they are easy to grasp because they are cliches. And at the same time, they are thoroughly opaque, because no explanation can attempt to cast light on the intangible. It is mystical. Here it struck me that a religiously trained calligrapher would be inclined to explanations which remain transcendental and therefore escape inquiry. In this worldview, ultimately, there are things which cannot be understood with reason or mastered through practice. Tellingly, the mystical aspects are most frequently alluded to in the commercial exploitation of Islamic calligraphy. And more often than not, this is the case when the work sorely needs divine backup to convince. Now, my stance is in polar opposition to this perspective. It is based on the premise that, in principle, all human achievements are comprehensible and attainable by all human beings. You do not have to be native to a community in order to participate in its culture. This stance seeks transparency in its explanations and its practice, and it has no room for mystic concepts. How, then, does this relate to the title of my talk, you might ask? Let me try to explain. The phrase, there is nothing Arabic about the Arabic script, paraphrases a quote by Daniel Chandler that relates to the semiotic analysis of a sign. There is nothing tree-ish about the word tree neatly summarizes the concept of arbitrariness in signs. In semiotics, a sign is divided into a signifier and a signified, whereby the signifier constitutes the expression, usually visual or audio, and the signified constitutes the meaning of the sign. This relationship is commonly expressed in a triangular configuration of the thing or concept the sign relates to, the signifier, and the signified. For our purpose here, the essential realization is that there is no necessary, intrinsic, or inevitable relationship between the signifier and the signified. The word tree is not more tree-ish than nitwit would be. The reason we think of a big plant with a trunk when we hear tree, and someone not so smart when we hear nitwit, is purely a convention. In French, the sound to denote big plant with a trunk is arbre. In German, baum. And in Arabic, shajara. But the tree itself does not therefore change. 
Likewise, the writing systems that humans have invented and use the recorder sign denoting the concept of a tree are vastly diverse, and most of them have absolutely nothing tree-ish about them. Indeed, it is one of the most important aspects of non-pictorial writing that the relation between the mark and the meaning that it carries is flexible. It allowed for the spread of writing and its adoption by different cultures using different languages. There are dozens of languages of utterly different linguistic makeup that use the Latin script. But curiously, it never occurs to anyone to ask, say, an American type designer whether he speaks any Finnish when designing Latin type. The Arabic script has also traveled far and wide and is used for languages as diverse as Malay, Persian, and Urdu some of which are closer in their linguistic lineage to European languages than the Semitic Arabic. Indeed, if one wanted to be facetious, one could even point out that most of the letters and sounds of Arabic and Hebrew are extremely similar, and query what this could mean for cultural proximity and comprehension. But of course, I don't want to go there. In the Middle Ages, the Arabic script was used on the Iberian Peninsula to write Spanish and Portuguese, and until Ataturk's radical break in 1928, for centuries Turkish had been written with the Arabic script. Many of the greatest calligraphers of the Arabic script were not Arab, but Persian or Turkish. Now, given this rich cultural variety, I wonder how well versed the calligrapher I've mentioned earlier is in Urdu poetry, Persian history, Tajik literature, or indeed, the cuisine from Penang. In all seriousness, one should keep in mind that the exclusivity claims implied in the emphasis on Arabicness have an undertone of cultural hegemony. By accepting and repeating them, one does a disservice to communities which have a historical or religious connection with the Arab world, but are otherwise culturally distinct. Considering the Arabic script from an only Arabic language perspective denies these other cultures uh, and languages an equal standing and overshadows their identities. An Arab colleague's website even explicitly lists Arab and non-Arab designers doing Arabic script type. Just imagine doing the same for Finnish and non-Finnish designers doing Latin script type. It would be a bloody long list. I would suggest that for type design, language is only in as much of concern as it has a tangible and visible effect on the appearance of text. And furthermore, that language properties on this level are purely visual, with no relevant connections to the semantic level. Or in other words, it does not matter for the design of a letter shape what sound it represents. And it follows that type design for a particular script is independent from proficiency in a given language that just happens to use that script in its written form. However, this does not make it any easier. On the graphical level, cultural preferences and associations, visual dialects and conventions are equally existent. And it is here that the designer's work unfolds. Expertise on this level requires substantive learning and research, as well as immersion in the artifacts of the written word. Arguably, it is harder to attain expertise here, because the conventions, history, and principles of the written word are poorly documented. There are no dictionaries of visual dialects that I could consult for a Maghribi or an Urdu design, nor are there rule books of applied Arabic typography as we know them from the Latin script world. Therefore, this finally leads me to present some of my work. The stance that I champion needs to incorporate a substantial degree of research to navigate these uncharted territories. Such uncharted territories are something that I encountered in my work for the BBC. In 2010, the World Services design team trialed typefaces for a redesign of their Arabic script websites. It turned out that my Nassim, with its range of weights and its contemporary feel, worked best, and my suggestion to customize it for their needs was well received. So I was commissioned to develop tailored versions of the fonts for their different language sites, Arabic, Persian, Pashto and Urdu. Originally, Nassim had been conceived as an Arabic typeface with a Persian touch. However, it should be usable for both languages, feeling neither too Arabic nor too Persian. 
or so I thought. As the first BBC language title was going to be redesigned was Arabic, I set out to make Nassim look more Arabic. What did that mean? To generalize, let me put it this way. My understanding was the type which more closely related to the manuscript form tends to get perceived as being more Arabic, whereas type that is more typographic tends to be seen as more Persian. And when I first designed Nassim, I tried to situate it somewhere in between. Therefore, turning it more Arabic meant for me primarily to include a range of ligatures. And thus, based on frequency of occurrence and typographic conventions, I tested and selected a range of ligatures that would be suitable for typeface and application. Moreover, I changed those letter forms that I had designed in line with the Persian custom and gave them more, um, a more Arabic touch. And as you can imagine, I'm talking about subtle and not necessarily tangible issues of perception and tradition. Upon the first review, however, it turned out that the situation was rather different to what I had imagined. Rather than having to convince the design team, I had to convince the journalists. And they, while being undoubtedly women and men of letters, are not necessarily women men of letter forms. In their feedback, the sole point of reference became Ariel. By implication, this meant, of course, that Ariel was elevated to serve as the archetypal model for Arabic type, a questionable choice. And I had to argue why in my design I didn't do things as they were done there. And while this was a case of client education, the preconception that native speakers knew better, even without subject-specific expertise, illustrates the point that I made earlier. In the event, it was possible to demonstrate not only that things can be done differently, but they might actually be done better than if done by a scenario. Moreover, there were numerous technical hurdles to be taken, but I'm afraid that I don't have the time here today to discuss them. So to summarize very brutally, by January 2011, everything that we could do on our end was done, <laughs> and the new website was launched. I may remind you at this point, in case you missed the industry update, that uh, at this point in January 2011, only 1% of all websites used web fonts at all. And the redesign was a dramatic overhaul, and it created quite a stir at the time. For the first time, there was actively designed Arabic typography on the web, and Nassim was its protagonist. This was a proud moment for me, especially since this was the beginning of the Arab Spring. A month after the BBC site was launched, Mubarak was ousted, and it was a time when one could, one could still be hopeful for the immediate future of the region. There was not much time to celebrate, however, as the Persian relaunch was scheduled soon after. And here the customization attained particular importance because Iranians and Arabs are more than keen to underline their cultural differences. As I had expected, the general feedback was that my design looked too Arabic, and it had to be pushed in a more Persian direction. But what exactly the Persian quality of a typeface is was much harder to establish. Traditionally, Nastali calligraphy is considered quintessentially Persian, but this was not an option for the BBC website. In typography, certain stylistic characteristics have become associated with Persian too, and on, th on this level I sought the answers. By chance, this phase of the job coincided with the moment during my PhD research when I investigated the history of Persian type making. So while I was tasked to revise Nassim to make it look more Persian, I found about similar precedents. For example, in the 1960s, an Iranian newspaper bought linotype machinery and asked for the accompanying typeface to be made more Persian. To this end, the manager of the newspaper provided linotype with a catalog of the letters they wanted to be modified. Now, while I was investigating this particular history, I received lists assembled by the editors of the BBC Persian with desired design changes. So here I was, reading letters from 60 years ago concerning linotype hot metal composition, and at the same time I received startlingly similar emails concerning the design of the first Arabic web fonts. This historical perspective provided me with some solace, as I saw how people before me grappled with notions of typographic cultural identity. And what it also shows is the applied use and value of historical research for contemporary practice. But curiously, also in the Persian feedback, Ariel served as the default reference by which type forms were evaluated. 
Although the Arabic team thought the design was too Persian and the Persian team thought the design was too Arabic, both chose the same model as a reference. Strange as this may be, and while some of the suggestions seemed too strongly influenced by the assistant font, others were interesting and opened my eyes to the perceived Persianness in Arabic type. So I set to work again to revise Nassim and make it more, more Persian. Now when I sent them my first proof, in addition to the revision of individual glyphs, I kept the ligatures that I had made for the Arabic version. I wanted to test the vague notion that a design with less manuscript influence was really considered to be more Persian. So while this was the trial version that they had tested, the Persian font was going to be this. Interestingly, the idea that ligatures are not perceived as Persian was confirmed in this case. So rather than having chocolate and caramel drizzle on top, they wanted a plain vanilla, maybe with a touch of saffron. It was fine by me, as it established a design notion that I had had, and it made the font smaller. But of course, it also showed that one just cannot make it right for everyone. A few months later, when the Persian website was launched, a German orientalist told me that he was in shock at the wrong version of this very type form. And when the website was launched in April 2011, reactions were polarized. While some lauded the new type, others thought it was old-fashioned. Personally, I most enjoyed the conversation that evolved on the blog of Bruce Bahmani, a vocal member of the US Persian community. He praised Nassim for its absolute pleasure to read. But in the comments, someone pointed out that the type was actually done by Tariq Atrisi, a Lebanese colleague working in the Netherlands, and noted angrily that the BBC Persian had commissioned an Arab for the job. Some readers remarked that Nastalik would have been better and others rebuked the comment that it is problematic to have an Arab design a Persian typeface. Eventually, a user stepped up to set the record straight and wrote. First of all, I do not see anything wrong if a talented Lebanese typographer designs a font for the BBC, but it, I should mention that the designer is not Tariq Atrisi, but Titus Nemet, a designer from the Netherlands. <laughs> Given the Dutch tradition and excellence in type design, this can only be a compliment for an Austrian, and I took it as such. In further iterations of a similar process, we developed dedicated Urdu and Pashto versions of the fonts, which were launched late in 2011 and put to great use in the 2012 presidential election in the US. In the years since the redesign, the visitor numbers of all their sites kept growing, and despite another facelift in 2014, Nassim was kept as the principal type for all Arabic script sites and is still in use today in terms of internet longevity, a significant period of time. In the latest version of the website, emphasis was put on consistency across devices and a fully responsive setup that works without dedicated mobile sites. Now, with significant advances in standards compliance and web phone support that was not there in 2011, looking at you, Chrome, Arabic web phones can now di be displayed across devices and platforms. The large-scale use of Arabic web fonts by the BBC set a precedent, an example for many other sites and the trade at large. Indeed, in a recent issue of iMagazine, Kamal Mansour, Monotypes Manager of Non-Latin Products, singled out the BBC Arabic script sites as the example for the impact of web fonts. My favorite illustration, though, is an Iranian propaganda website that pretends to be the BBC. Here, the 2011 design is largely copied down to the typography in Nassim. While worrisome, in many regards, it is compelling evidence of the branding power of type. Unfortunately for me, the popularity of Nassim in Iran is ambiguous, as it is widely pirated. Even the website of one of the biggest and most renowned newspapers of Iran, Kehan, uses it without a license. But in doubt, I will just assume that all the Iranian users simply did not license the type yet because of the sanctions and can now swiftly correct the situation. <laughs> to wrap up, I hope that I've been able to demonstrate that Arabic type design, and I would argue type design in general, is largely agnostic of language and that the equation of script and language is a frequent but erroneous assumption. And while I love my tabul and my hummus, I know that eating more of it won't make me any better at Arabic type design. <laughs> the stance that I have been alluding to is born from practice. 
and the practice that I champion is informed by sound research. In other words, even though you don't necessarily have to be fluent in any particular language to design type for a particular script, it won't be less work or any easier. Most scripts of the world still have significant evolutionary path ahead before the typographic cultures will reach the quality and variety of expression that we know from the Latin world. And for the steps along these paths to be of substance, much more investment in research and practice will be needed. In my work, I aspire to contribute to this exciting prospect. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much.